Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. I want to use this video to basically go back to transiting exoplanets yet again. I've done lots of videos on variations of the transit of an exoplanet which relate to different things about the system, the planet, things like that. And the transits themselves can vary. Now, this particular one is relating to eclipsing binary stars. And you can actually detect an exoplanet due to the variation in the transiting stars, basically. OK, so what I've actually got here is the transits to the upper left there of the planet. Now, this doesn't necessarily relate to the transit of the planet itself. The planet might not transit, it might do, but what we're interested in here is the actual eclipsing binary stars themselves and so when they eclipse each other. So what I'm going to do is just quickly introduce transiting exoplanets again, just in case you haven't seen any of the other videos or you're not familiar. But if you found your way to this video, then you're probably familiar with it anyway. So skip along to the eclipsing binary part, I suppose. So one way of detecting exoplanets is to look for a dip in brightness of the star. As a planet passes in front, it blocks out some of the light. We get a dip in the brightness, which looks like a bit of a U-shaped dip, essentially. It looks like this. It's quite straightforward. The bigger the planet, the bigger the dip. So we can then detect planets due to that method. Now, normally, if it's a single star, single planet, and there's nothing exciting happening there, then each of your transits are going to look the same. And the time between is going to be the orbital period. And that isn't going to significantly change. So we basically end up with symmetric transits with an equal amount of time in between, which relates to how long it takes to go around the actual star. Now, what we want to do is go back to the eclipsing binary light curve. So again, I did a, a whole video on this, but I'm going to recap it anyway in case you haven't seen that. So eclipsing binaries are basically a two star system. You can have more actually, but a eclipsing binary refers to two stars. They are orbiting a common centre of mass and they will pass in front of each other, a bit like a planet passes in front of the star. So as we look at it from Earth, we see them passing in front. We don't actually see them passing in front of each other. We see them blocking each other's light out in the same manner which a planet would do to a star. So the orientation of this system has to be kind of edge on. So their orbits mean that they will pass in front of each other and then they'll separate and get closer again. And that's what we mean by eclipsing binary. They essentially eclipse each other as seen from Earth. Now, most of the time these stars are far too far away that we can't actually resolve them. We can typically only see one star. We can measure the brightness of that single star. They're just too far away to resolve the two individual ones. So what we're getting is the combined light from both of those stars. So if we then look at the light curve of an eclipsing binary, so a light curve, again, if you haven't come across this before, it's basically just the brightness of the star, the magnitude, the flux given off by a star as a function of time. So over time, the brightness of that star might change. With an eclipsing binary, we're measuring the, the light from both stars. And as they eclipse each other, we get dips in brightness. So this would be one orbital phase of, well, pretty much an orbital phase of an eclipse in binary. You have a, a big dip and a little dip in brightness. Why do you get that? Well, if you've got two stars, they're typically going to be different sizes. You're not going to get two stars exactly the same size. You might get them quite close, but typically one will be bigger than the other. So one is brighter than the other. Now, when both stars are fully separated, we actually get the maximum brightness. So the peak brightness is when they are fully separated. They're not eclipsing each other at all. Now, the biggest dip that we get is when the small star, so in this case here, the yellow one, is in front of the bigger star. So that basically means it's blocking out the most light. The bigger star is going to be brighter, so it blocks out more light in that configuration there. And then on the other way around, when the bigger star eclipses the smaller star, then you get the smaller dip in brightness as we view it. So that's what that comes from. And then as they separate again, we get the peak brightness. That's where your light curve comes from for an eclipsing binary. Now, 
there's a big difference, well, maybe not a big difference, but there's a difference between the transit of an exoplanet and the eclipse of a star on another star. Now, with a exoplanet transit, you get this U-shaped dip in brightness, and that's because the planet is smaller and it's not really comparably as bright as the star is. So when it once it goes across the star, it will block out almost an equal amount of light as it goes across. It's not quite, it gives a, a rounded bottom due to limb darkening. Again, another video. So you get this U-shaped dip for a exoplanet most of the time. An eclipsing binary eclipse is more V-shaped because the two objects, the two stars, are more comparable in size. So by the time a star has started to go across the other star, it's almost beginning to exit on the other side. So you get a, a sharp drop in, in brightness and then it starts to increase again because they're almost the same size. So you get a V-shape dip in brightness. And that's an, an easy way to actually distinguish between exoplanets and eclipsing binaries, although it's not exactly the case. Because if you actually get an exoplanet that transits just on the edge of a star, it can appear V-shaped as well. But as a general rule, V for eclipsing binary, U for a exoplanet. Now, yeah, as we mentioned before, the star is much larger than a planet and the planet will take a lot longer to go across. So transit times, you're going to get slightly different things. So the configurations are slightly different, but not too fussed about this for this part. OK, so back to the eclipsing binary and their orbits. They orbit a common centre of mass. This is known as the barycenter. So they're both orbiting that. They're not essentially, well, you don't have one of those orbiting the other. They're orbiting this common centre of mass instead. OK, this is important. Now, if you then have a planet that goes around the outside of that eclipsing binary, so it's orbiting the eclipsing binary itself, the barycenter is then no longer the centre of the eclipsing binary. All three objects are orbiting the barycenter. So that means the eclipsing binary part actually orbits around the barycenter as the planet goes around as well. And this is an important aspect for this. So they're both orbiting the barycenter. What that basically means is you get a change in the timing of your eclipses for your binary system. So we don't necessarily have to get the transit of an exoplanet to detect it. We can just look for variations in the eclipse times of the eclipsing binary because it, it, it can occur early, it can occur late because it's, a, it's orbiting this barycenter. So from our point of view, sometimes it appears to occur early, sometimes it's later than it should be. So this might explain it a bit better actually. Maybe a nice picture explains it. So here, as they're eclipsing each other, depending on where they are and the planet. Now, I've kind of depicted this kind of wrong because the, the barycenter planet and the eclipsing binary system should be kind of um, through a line, really. But it, it doesn't matter just for this visualization. So on one of those, your eclipse of the binary will occur earlier than the other one because it's further around than it's all, but it's gone a little bit further around. So it appears slightly later or slightly earlier. And it's because this eclipsing binary is then orbiting this common centre of mass once you've got that extra planet there. Now, what you can then do is if you measure the timing effect, so if it's early or late, and you measure that over time, you'll get this sort of almost sine wave, this variation. The variation in that timing, the period of that variation, can then give you the orbit of the planet. Even if we don't detect the planet directly, that variation, that oscillation in the timing, so it will go early, then late, back again, you get a cycle. That's the orbital period of the planet that we might not be able to actually detect. So that's one way of detecting an exoplanet using eclipsing binaries. So thank you for watching. If you enjoy the videos, find them helpful then do consider becoming a member. Obviously, it helps support the channel going forward making these videos, but there are also extra videos in the member section as well as other benefits as well.